Okay, so welcome back from your lunch. It's great to see you all here. Um, so this session is Working Across Sectors for Children's Protection and Wellbeing, Emerging Good Practice in Collaboration and Partnership. Um, as some of you should, most of you should know, um, cross-sectoral collaboration, working across sectors, is one of the Alliance's strategic priorities. All of the Alliance's strategic priorities have um, an initiative and an advisory group. Uh, my name is Elspeth and I am the advocacy focal point in the Alliance Secretariat team and also the focal point for our working across sectors. And I'm joined with me today by Susanna Davies, who is also um, one of the co-leads for the working across sectors advisory group amongst many other hats that Susanna wears, uh, and Silvia Onyate from Plan International, who is the other uh, co-lead of the um, Working Across Sectors Advisory Group. Uh, and we have our esteemed panelists that Susanna will be introducing shortly. So as we know, uh, children's, um, children's needs are holistic and no one sector alone can, can meet the needs of children. And we heard this morning a powerful call to action in our panel in that if we are really truly accountable to children, we need to break down silos and work with other sectors collaboratively. And this is what we are striving to do. And this session today is for us to really share um, some of our collaboration, our experiences, our good practices, our challenges, and get your really vital inputs on some of our partnerships as we look forward. And also as we look forward to our next strategic period, which starts in 2026. And we're at a very critical listening phase now where we want to hear from you um, about what you think we should be prioritizing as we move forward. So, um, the next slide, please. Oh. Tengo, ah, perfecto. Um, so we have an advisory group. I think Susanna will give you a little overview of this at the end of the session. But if you are interested in the advisory group, which is essentially a group of passionate working across sectors, advocates and practitioners that come together to support, provide strategic direction across our various partnerships, please do let us know. We're always looking for new voices, new experiences to join us. Um, and looking at the next slide, please. Uh, our session today, the welcome has almost finally finished. Um, and I'll hand over to Susanna to lead a panel discussion on emerging good practices, followed by a group activity and a conclusion. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to Susanna. Thanks very much, Elspeth. And thanks everyone for joining us today. So um, could we pop along to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so I am really pleased uh, to be here with you and be with all of these really wonderful panelists, each of whom is leading a different area of work um, for their agency or an interagency project on working across sectors. I think we've seen since um, the new edition of the minimum standards was launched in 2019, a great deal of work done across the child protection sector to develop practical tools to build partnerships with other sectors for how we can advance children's protection and well-being holistically i'm going to start our panel with some really brief framing remarks i know i'm in a friendly audience where i probably don't have to convince you of the importance of working across sectors and why other humanitarians from other technical sectors should care about <coughs> children's protection and well-being. But I'm going to try and do it a little bit anyways, mostly to give you um, to give you fodder, to give you talking points. If you're one of the people who has to make this argument, if you're in a response where you're trying to convince some colleagues, where we're giving you some of the arguments and many of them you also heard in our really great panel this morning. So I'll start very briefly with that, and then I will hand over, I will introduce and hand over to all of the lovely panelists that are with me. So first, why are we working across sectors? This is the slide that we have up now. Why is this important and why do we care about it? As you heard in our kind of opening panel this morning, some really stark statistics about the escalation of humanitarian crises and conflict globally. Um, and I really appreciated some of the points that were brought out um, 
by our colleagues, particularly by Hani, on the, the scale and severity of that. This is not a crisis that the child protection sector alone can meet. We are a critical part of it. Specialized child protection services are a critical part of it, but we need the whole of the humanitarian response to have child protection at its core, to understand children's well-being, and to prioritize it in each and everything <coughs> that we do. Um, so I won't repeat kind of all of the statistics that were shared this morning, but I think one, one really struck me that I think is worth underlining underlining that Shima shared this morning in terms of the, the number of children who are impacted right now, living in or fleeing conflict zones. And the statistic that Shima shared with us was that it's 46 million children. And I did a little bit of Googling in our break time. 46 million children is roughly equivalent to the entire population of Spain or Argentina. So if we think that that is the number of children globally, that are living in or fleeing conflict zones, imagine how the globe would react if the entire population, each and every single person in Spain, was fleeing. Or each and every single person in Argentina was fleeing. How, what scale of reaction do you think we could expect to see? And compare that with the reaction we are seeing from the global community right now to child protection crises. It's not proportionate. The, the seriousness and the dedication of resources is not meeting the needs that are there. So I think this working across sectors, the partnerships that we're building and the advocacy that we can do together with colleagues from other sectors is really critical to communicating this scale and severity and also to finding the innovative solutions that are there that will help us to rise to, to meet the, the current global context, which is very different than um, many of us who have been around for a decade or two. It, it is a very different world um, than when we began our careers. Some of the other um, points that, um, that we have on the slide, I won't go through each and every one of them. These will be made available to you and we'll tell you where to find them. Um, but we know that every humanitarian sector has a role um, to contribute to keeping children safe. We know that children's uh, needs are multi-sectoral. And I think one of the great points that came out again from our panel this morning that we heard colleagues from World Vision talking about is that when child protection is included as a central outcome <coughs> of a humanitarian response, when integrated approaches are used, we see not only a reduction in the, the effects on children's protection needs, we see not only an impact in that sense, but we see better humanitarian outcomes for better outcomes for children in those other sectors. If child protection is integrated, we see better nutrition outcomes. We see certainly better education results, uh, which I know some of my colleagues will talk about um, shortly. And we're increasingly having not only good practice examples, but evidence for this. Um, so certainly an area that we need to that we need to be focusing on and promoting. If I can go to the next slide as well. Some of the other key points that we point about uh, that we are pointing to in terms of the why of working across sectors, we're talking about um, reducing the risk um, that humanitarian action itself is causing harm. And I know from some of the really active discussions we had in the regional dialogue yesterday that we do acknowledge that when our, the humanitarian response is blind to children's protection needs, it is causing harm. It can exacerbate those protection needs. Whereas the inverse is equally true. When, when a humanitarian response has child protection mainstreamed well throughout the response, we see that we can be preventing harm to children. Um, and that's a really key argument for us and a key argument in terms of cost efficiency as well. And with dwindling resources, that's also, um, that's also a way that we hope to advance uh, working across sectors and better results for children. So I'll go to the next slide and almost wrap up. Um, so we've had this discussion this morning, but our kind of place to start in terms of working across sectors, if you're trying to engage another sector and you're not quite sure, I see that there are some problems with camp management, but I'm not quite sure how, what are the key actions, what needs to be done. 
the child protection minimum standards are your starting point. Pillar four has all of the key actions, has indicators for bilateral collaboration with different sectors. But I think the reason we've put that QR code up as well is that increasingly we have we have this um, working together hub on the alliances webpage, um, where increasingly we have joint resources, jointly developed tools with other sectors. Um, on our panel alone, we'll have examples from food security, from education, um, from collaboration with GBV colleagues. There's also quite a lot of work happening uh, with the camp management and camp coordination sector, increasing examples with health. All of these you can find there. And we are there are kind of building partnerships where this is something that we're developing jointly. It's not child protection or the alliance going off on their own and saying this is what we think health colleagues should do, but rather working collaboratively and, and, and in partnerships. So I do encourage you um, to check out that hub if you haven't, and we hope that we will continue to grow it um, with some of the really great examples that we know will come out um, from our discussion shortly. So without further ado, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. I'm so pleased to introduce our panelists. Um, we've got a really great group presenting um, some different areas of work that are happening. So right now, I'm just going to flip my page so I get my titles right. Mm. Thank you. Um, so we'll start in just a moment uh, with my colleague Jessica Stewart Clark, who's the Child Protection and SGBV Information Management Officer uh, with UNHCR's uh, division in Geneva. Thank you for joining us, Jessica. And to her right, we also have Silvia Onate, my colleague who also co-leads the Working Across Sectors Advisory Group. Uh, Silvia is um, a child protection and emergency specialist with Plan International, and she's leading their work with the food security uh, sector and will share um, some of the key points and advancements that have been made there. And then we have Rachel McKinney, who's the team lead for thematic areas um, with the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies. Um, as many of you would know, the Alliance and INEE have been working together for many years. Uh, and Rachel will give us a little bit of an update on what's new in that partnership and what we can look forward to. Um, and last but certainly not least, we're so pleased to have Debla Lopez with us. She is the Regional Gender and Gender-Based Violence Specialist um, with UNICEF's Latin America and Caribbean Regional Office. Um, I think many of you in the room might be aware that the gender-based violence sector has done a lot of work um, over many years on risk mitigation and particularly engaging um, other sectors to mitigate the risks of GBV. And I think they have a fair few lessons learned that child protection actors could learn from and a number of areas where we could collaborate. So we're really pleased to have Deborah with us as well. Um, so with that, I would love to get started with Jessica, if I can do. Um, one moment. Too many papers. Okay, Jessica, could you tell us a little bit about UNHCR's new child protection policies and how it will impact cross sectoral work for children's protection and well being? Sure. Um, I'm always nervous with a microphone, so I'm going to do, <laughs> do my best. Um, so thank you so much for the question. It's really exciting that UNHCR has released its new child protection policy this year. Um, we have had a, a framework on child protection, but this policy makes mandatory across our organization, all sectors, all divisions, every operation. It makes those child protection considerations and working towards towards child protection outcomes, everybody's problem. And I think that's what I find most exciting about the new policy is that it is not just for child protection staff to be working on child protection. It is not just for child protection staff to be working on child protection mainstreaming, but really making it an organization wide commitment. So this new policy that has been released is is accompanied by explainer videos and summaries. And we will we will make those links available on the Alliance uh, page for you. But I think that um, for for probably the part that I want to bring your attention to is in our policy, we have these core 
program actions. We basically really tried to whittle down to what do, what must we do and who must do it. And there is the core program action number five, which is specific to working across sectors. And in that, it outlines what what must we do and who must be doing it? And it looks at, for example, where UNHCR is implementing for forcibly displaced and stateless children. Where is UNHCR in more of an advocacy role or directly implementing? Where do we work with our partners and what do we do? And it really uh, sets out to make it as practical as humanly possible, what is the requirement for UNHCR at a global, regional, operational level, but also how do we work with our partners and what do we focus on and some of those key messages. So just to say um, that I've only got a few minutes and I'm not a brief person, but really it is about recognizing the crucial, crucial role that all humanitarian sectors play, as you were mentioning earlier, in meeting children's needs, in having child protection outcomes be strengthened. It is not down to one sector, child protection, um, that really we see that if we want to have ensuring safe access to education, if we want to have uh, be addressing the economic drivers, all these different aspects that contribute to the care and protection of children, no matter where they come from and where they find themselves, we have to be working better with each other. And our policy makes that mandatory for UNHCR and its operations and all the agencies that we work with, whether funded or unfunded. Um, and I think that's really exciting and a shift that you should keep your eyes on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. I think it sounds like with the CP policy, as you were saying, being mandatory and including those core actions on child protection mainstreaming, it's a tool not only that is going to have to be used by UNHCR staff and operations, but it's perhaps um, a key advocacy tool for mm. colleagues at the operational level if you find that you are engaging and perhaps you aren't seeing CP mainstreaming doing so well. Um, and it can be something that helps us build that together. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, I will um, move on to Sylvia now. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more specifically about the progress that's being made in collaboration with food security and maybe any lessons learned that or lessons that you are learning um, for building partnerships for children's protection and well-being thank you susanna for the question and thank you everyone for listening and for the interest uh, you know in this area of work so this initiative about child protection food security started like a few years ago and the aim, the objective is to strengthen collaboration between child protection and food security actors. So this is interagency. So that's the overall aim and goal. So with the um, funding, so thanks to the support of um, UNICEF, uh, German funding, BHA, we had made some progress in the last years. And I want to mention four things. So we have started collaboration and partnership actually with the Global Child Protection AOR. We've been collaborating with the Food Security Cluster. Um, and also we've been feeding and contributing to the Working Across Sectors Advisory Group uh, through the Alliance. So these forums have helped us um, to get um, resources endorsed by child protection and food security actors, but also has helped us a lot in enabling us to access um, context and to work specifically at country level as well. Um, so that's number one. Number two, in terms of other progress, talking about country level and practitioners, we've been supporting um, interagency, child protection subsector, and also food security sector in different contexts, uh, in Nigeria, in Central African Republic, in South Sudan, and most recently in Cox's Bazar, where we have um, done like country workshops and brought together child protection and food security actors together 
to learn from each other and start identifying areas for collaboration. So that look different, the actions identified in different contexts. To give you an example, I was three weeks ago in Cox's Bazaar, and one of the actions agreed there was to set up a technical task team between child protection and food security to document and gather evidence on linkages between food security and child protection, and also to revise some of the selection criteria, uh, targeting procedure and referrals uh, happening at different levels. So that's number two. Um, and then on, we also had progress in terms of development of resources that are available. Um, we have produced, we identified there was a lack of some evidence. So we produce a global evidence on uh, linkages between food security and child protection that I was actually sharing with some of you before in the marketplace and it's available in many different languages. Um, and actually highlight some of the linkages, but also like some of the collaboration identified, some practices are also documented and some key actions. Um, and then we have also developed child protection mainstreaming e-modules um, for child protection mainstreaming into food security and nutrition programming. So those are some of the, you know, the existing technical tools and guidance that we have developed. So that's some of the progress. Um, we have more that have been contextualized at country level, but I will keep it short and brief. Uh, and then maybe the last point I want to make in terms of progress is on the advocacy side. We also developed and be, was endorsed interagency, some key messages for target, different target groups, uh, which were shared in different forums. Um, and, but that's also an area where we want to keep working as we identify some challenges and we want to, together with the Alliance, do some global review on the existing frameworks from UNHCR, from the LFP, and identify the actually entry points to strengthen collaboration between child protection and food security. And you ask uh, Susanna about, okay, what have we learned? What are we learning? Um, so I want to share some key lessons uh, from the collaboration so far. Uh, one is on getting right people um, on, you know, uh, together, um, the same time, in the same room. So that sometimes requires some patience, some, you know, planning. Uh, but we wanted to make sure, like we learned that, you know, we needed to have the food security cluster coordinator and the child protection uh, subsector coordinator when we were doing the country workshop, for example. When we are developing an integrated framework, we wanted to make sure the technical advisor group having child protection experts, but also food security experts, because otherwise the products would have, you know, wouldn't be relevant and would be owned and accepted. So that's on one side in terms of partnership, having the right people and right time in the same place, same room. The second one is on, you know, starting from basics on learning from each other, like getting when we do the country workshops and when we think about materials is, you know, being able to understand and listen to each other or like what are our interventions in child protection? What are interventions in food security? You know, simple things like selection criteria, how do we target, you know, is very sometimes like unknown for the other actors. And that's sometimes like eye opening to see like, you know, people working and making referrals to each other don't know. So that was, you know, a lesson learned to start like, you know, from basics that will enable for, better collaboration. Um, and then the last point was we want to go beyond and the collaboration to also if we identify evidence on linkages to focus on integration, but we want to reinforce also the message on and we think it's been working well and we need to do more on reinforcing the message on child protection mainstreaming also in integrated programs um, and beyond. And maybe I'll stop here because I'm, I'm seeing this sign. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks very much, Sylvia. I think like the, the last couple of points are really interesting ones to, to re-emphasize and for colleagues to take away, like this focus on um, not assuming that another sector understands what we do and also not assuming that we understand what they do and how they work. There's really different kind of values and perspectives and starting from that place of learning from each other is how you build a partnership. And also this point about making sure you have the right people in the room and you're bringing them together to to build that relationship because it is it is a partnership you do have to you do have to create that trust and that collaboration if we want to see sort of the actions carried forward so i think those are those are ones that i hope we can carry across all of our sectoral engagement okay moving on um, so I think as a lot of colleagues in the room will know, and certainly you might know if you went to, to um, their stand at the, the marketplace a little bit earlier, um, child protection and education have a really long history of collaboration and working together. As two child-focused sectors, we have uh, a really powerful ability to, to collaborate and advance impact for our children when we do it well. Um, so I'm going to turn uh, to Rachel, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what's new, what's happening these days in terms of the collaboration between uh, INEE, the Interagency Network for Education Emergencies, and the Alliance on Child Protection in Education. Sure, thank you. Um, first, I, I have to start by thanking the panelists from this morning, the first panel, because I feel like so many of those messages first resonated with me, but also clearly indicated the long existence um, and collaboration between the two sectors. And um, I don't have time to pick up on all of those elements, but just to say thank you for raising those in the in the first panel. Um, as Susanna mentioned, we of course have had a long um, standing collaboration. In 2018, uh, the two networks met uh, for our first round table and formalized a partnership, a collaboration that we call the Joint Initiative. And all of this information is, of course, on both of our websites, and you can read about it in more detail. But we recognized as both sectors that we um, have shared um, a shared vision of first focusing on, on children. And secondly, um, when we do talk to communities, the affected communities of crises, they more often than not prioritize these two sectors in every response, in every assessment, when you ask children, when you ask the families, perhaps not in the first days, but pretty soon after, after the initial crises. And we also reinforce each other's sectoral approaches and outcomes. So with the formal collaboration um, uh, called the Joint Initiative, as I mentioned, we um, pulled together an advisory group, as uh, I believe each of us have, or each of the initiatives has. And together, we conceived of several foundational pieces of work. One was a position paper to identify the touch points between our two sectors. So that identifies where in our operational space we regularly come in contact um, and overlap and have opportunities to intersect if we don't already, to collaborate and integrate um, programming. From that position paper, we developed a guidance note on supporting integrated programming. And that position or that guidance note then um, and the advisory group identified three key areas of work that we are committed to taking forward together as both um, networks. INEE and the Alliance. And the three key areas are reflected in not only um, you know, the, the uh, current joint initiative, but were also captured in our joint pledge for the Global Refugee Forum uh, at the end of last year. And they are, first, um, a real um, intentional rollout and dissemination of very practical tools that support integrated programming. We, we acknowledge and value, of course, mainstreaming and um, joint programming, but we want to really lean into supporting integrated programming, knowing the importance and the, and the impact that um, is, is a real potential for both sectors. 
So with the dissemination and rollout of those of um, that guidance note together with our respective minimum standards and some key um, additional supplementary tools, we know that, and I, I was talking to several people um, at the marketplace, the because we are natural allies and advocates and partners, we have a lot of wonderful examples of integration in a variety of contexts. Those are not always captured in ways that we can lift up and share and ensure that lessons learned um, really inform best practices and policies at every level of you know, our work, both at the global level, regional, and then at national um, and subnational programming. So it's the second part of our commitment. We're really wanting to build out an evidence base, and that relies on a shared theory of change and a shared indicator framework. During the development of the guidance note, we realized that we could, there are a number of indicators. We all know that there are uh, a myriad of, of indicator frameworks in our own organizations, in, um, in any number of, of other partnerships, but we don't often have indicators that point to what's possible and how we best track um, the successes and the change that we want to see. And so part of that second part, the, the second commitment, in addition to the theory of change is a, a shared um, indicator framework. And then the third part is advocacy, that we know that our collective um, actions need to be lifted up in a way that shapes policy and practice at all levels, as I mentioned. And, and we know that that's the wheelhouse of, of the alliance. Um, and uh, really excited about um, thinking about how we, as the Education um, Interagency Network for Education Emergencies, can build um, something together with the Alliance, that we lean into each other's strengths and um, support each other's weak, weaker spaces as well. So um, we have uh, recently gone through a consultative process. Some of you may have been interviewed for that consultative process, but that was really to um, re-imagine um, what, what a work plan might look like, how we roll this out over the course of several years. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited about where this is going to go. Uh, and I, I really appreciated everyone who came up to the table of working across sectors to, to share a little about um, work that you are supporting or, or work that you would want to, to support. And I'm hopeful that through our, our joint connection um, that we can really build on the work already under, underway. Thanks very much, Rachel. It sounds like lots to look forward to in terms of practical tools out there, in terms of collaboration with advocacy. Um, and also to point out that after we get to the panel, we will get into further discussions. Um, and I think really interesting um, space for colleagues to be sharing the work that they're doing on education and child protection collaboration and learning, as you said, from some of those good examples that we don't, we don't always capture um, at the global level. So looking forward to that piece as well. Okay, so I'm going to turn to, to Debla now, if I can. Um, we have um, talked um, broadly about CP mainstreaming. We've heard from colleagues on food security and education. And now um, really eager to, to turn to you, Debla, to try and see, um, you know, from, from the GBV sector's work on risk mitigation and, inter and engagement with other sectors, um, what do you think the, the child protection sector can learn from you? What are some of, some of the tips and tricks that we need to we need to be turning on to? Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. I'll speak in Spanish if that is okay. First of all, being grateful for the invite to be here today. I'm really happy to be able to share with all of you during this afternoon. Definitely to say that for UNICEF, the difference between child protection and GBV is a very fine line. The specialists, 
uh, and the, all the specialists of child protection and gender-based violence work together. And it is very difficult to try to understand this difference. So from UNICEF, I can share these experiences and from the regional law office, from UNICEF to Latin America and the Caribbean. Working with the sectors, this, this is something that we have learned from the very first emergencies. I see some colleagues that we have worked together for some time now, from the very beginning, working in the sectors. Once you have the initial assessment done, you must take into consideration working with every colleague in a sectorial manner. We have to be invited, we have to be present, all the colleagues on child protection and GBV. We cannot be left off for a second round. Otherwise, the humanitarian program design wouldn't include the GBV part of it. And if we don't do this, we won't be able to mitigate problems afterwards. From the initial step when you are designing and implementing that response, if we are not present from the get-go, once it has been implemented, it will be difficult to change. A strategy that has worked out for us very well has been education, training, capacity building of other sectors, creating training with other sectors. Not necessarily giving out these speeches ourselves, but facilitate the training, having specific training with health sector or WASH or nutrition. These relationships that we have created, we have developed jointly the modules and we have called our colleagues from the sectors to be part of the training process and to share with us their experiences. This has been one of the best practices that we've had and the colleagues from different countries came and told us what they were doing. And oftentimes we just didn't know. And oftentimes we were learning a lot from them what they were doing in other countries. So training, education with colleagues from other sectors is key and it must be continuous. It cannot be once upon a time. No, it must be very frequent, at least yearly. So you have continuing education. Another important thing is to comprehend the language. So this training has helped to understand what is it that you're doing? What is your work? What the colleagues from nutrition or health or watch are working? What are the common points? How can we integrate the risk mitigation part of it. Also to invest when colleagues are coming on us, especially colleagues from the emergency sector, they are coordinating emergency responses and they are calling us, they're asking, please, this report, how do we present this proposal? You must always be available. You must be willing to help out so you can contribute with your 10 cents. and be there at that moment you have to be present and do the follow-up a continuous follow-up walking side by side with colleagues from different sectors so that they can understand what is our work and they can implement it as well also lately we have been talking a lot about joining certain expertise gbv with gca or with another uh, and the affected population sector. Understanding, of course, that when child protection meets with GBV, that's very good and we can work, but it has to do with a matter of resources as well. And you must understand that each of these sectors have their own specificity and we cannot understand and we cannot not working with colleagues that have expertise in this, but not on that. They know a little bit of this, but not of that. So we really have to respect the knowledge that we have from many years back, all colleagues and professionals on the ground. I'd say also all the issues of the region, we have 
good practices of joint work with colleagues from child protection. We have implemented safe spaces for uh, women and children in transit, in migration transit, where you have certain characteristics. We are close to friendly spaces or safe spaces where you integrate the wash issues and you see joint work from the colleagues of child protection, those of GBB and those of WASH. And this is integrated in safe spaces of women and girls. In Haiti, we are implementing also a nutrition clinic in which we offer services to response on GBV. And this work on nutrition is in the very beginning. And we would like to learn from other regions which are more advanced in this area. But we started working on advocacy, creating the links, what would be nutrition and GBV with certain outcomes, which have been very good to help us program the topics of evidence, knowledge, I believe that's key for the response. Thank you so Thank much, Jabla. A lot of information in a really short period of time. <laughs> and I think some some sort of themes emerging, um, if we look at kind of the lessons learned that Jabla was presenting to us around, you know, what you were capturing in terms of engagement and presence and that sort of goodwill to collaborate with colleagues to build those relationships and sometimes it means being willing to respond being willing to do a little bit of extra work and show adaptability so that piece around relationship building is clearly coming across from uh, all of the different um, sectoral uh, engagements i think one that uh, we haven't necessarily explored and some of the others that you focused on and i know there are some photos of it up here as well is what you were talking about uh, in terms of capacity building of other sectors and working with them not just on training but also other methodologies whether it's capacity exchange or coaching or like you know, having having ongoing groups, but noting that like a one off training on how you integrate children's protection into your sector is not going to be something that, that has the kind of impact that we want. We need to have that kind of ongoing collaboration and that ongoing focus on on capacity building um, and really also appreciated the last very practical example around safe spaces for women and children and the collaboration with WASH. Um, certainly something um, particularly in in this region where we have lots of um, lots of displaced children and children on the move the this option of of having these joint safe spaces and seeing how we engage with other sectors through those um is is a model for for us all to explore well a huge thank you and if i can invite our our, our audience to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists um, for sharing their experiences and the work that they're doing we are miraculously perfectly on time with our session plan so i feel like that also deserves a round of applause <laughs> um, so what we have planned next is to go into some group work because you've heard from these uh these colleagues on the stage and heard about some of their lessons learned we also want to create space for you to share yours um so i'm just going to hand over to elspeth to introduce the group activity which we'll go into in just a moment Okay, if everyone could just take a seat and if you could give us two more minutes of your time, we would really appreciate it. I do generally approve of people rebelling against group work ending because I know that means you're having really good discussions. Okay, so we just wanted to very briefly wrap up the session and if I can ask just to go to the last slide. Oh, Elspeth has it. Um, so. I just want to let you know what we're going to do with all of the great ideas and information that you've shared. We're running low on time, so we don't have time for each group to report back. But if you are in the groups, you would have noticed that your facilitators were taking very vigorous notes.
And what we hope to do is that myself and Elsbeth and Sylvia will be reviewing everything that you've captured. And it will be something that we reflect on in our advisory group on working across sectors. You've all recommended particular actions, particular areas of work that you would like to see the Alliance and its members take forward. We appreciate that we want to take that into consideration we want that to feed into our work plans and into how we advocate with our members um, and into potentially our next strategy period and it will absolutely also get reflected in the report of the annual meeting so first of all a really big thank you i can't speak for every group but the group that i was in was incredibly dynamic you were all very open you disagreed with each other sometimes times and you shared really excellent ideas. So a big thank you to everyone for engaging in the groups. Mm -hmm.